Well, I'll focus. No, no more Psalms ever sent. All done. But we're in Acts chapter 16 this morning. Acts 16, if you want to turn in the scripture to that great book that talks about the acts of the Holy Spirit after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There, there's a huge shift from the Psalms of Ascent to, in the Old Testament to the Acts chapter 16 in the New Testament. We're going, it's, it's leading us to Philippians is what's happening here. Leading us to Philippians. But a huge shift, Old Testament to New Testament, there's a shift in time from B.C. to A.D. There's a shift in literature from poetry to a historical narrative, telling of stories in history. There's a shift in culture from Jewish to Hellenistic Greek culture. There's a shift in religion from Judaism to Christianity and to paganism. There's a shift in language from Hebrew of the Old Testament to Greek of the New. There's a shift in geography from Jerusalem to Philippi, a Greek city. There's a shift in continents from the continent of Asia to the continent of Europe. But there's no shift in God's message. No shift in the message. No shift in his purpose of the word of God. And like Israel, Christians are to be kingdom, are to be a kingdom of priests to the world, anointed by the oil of the Spirit, as we saw in the Psalms of Ascent in Psalm 133, that God pours oil on us to be priests to the world. We're set apart by God to put God on display, showing the world what he is like. And what is so remarkable about the word, about Scripture, is how the telling of God's story intersects with the stories of other cultures. It meets them wherever they are. God's story seeks to reclaim a broken world. And it intersects with these other cultures, whether we're talking about the pyramids of Egypt or we're talking about the hanging gardens of Babylon or the Parthenon of Athens, or the Colosseum in Rome, or the theater in Philippi. And let's read how far the good news of Jesus Christ will go, will travel to redeem a broken world. In Acts chapter 16, let's stand together to give honor to the reading of God's word. Tell you what, after, after reading all of that, you may be wondering, where in the world are we? Oh, I know we're, we're in Acts chapter 16, but I mean, where in the world are we? And we are in modern-day Turkey. That's where we're at, where a lot of this is taking place. This is Turkey, and right over here is Greece. And Paul was a long ways from down in here, down in Israel. That's where we're at. It's all modern-day Turkey and Greece. But back in ancient times, what we find is we find Paul starting off in Jerusalem down here, making his way up to Antioch around Syria and Cilicia, up to Derby, like to Iconium, come to Pisidian Antioch. And that's where we picked up the story here in Acts chapter 16. And we heard some detours in the story, and we saw where Paul went. And he goes up north, tries to get into Bithynia. He can't get there. Mycia is right up here. And so he just goes down to Troas right there, and that's where we are in this story. A lot of places, places where things are happening in our world today. It's in the news quite a bit. And the Apostle Paul was, has been called to infiltrate these areas with the good news of Jesus Christ because he knew what C.S. Lewis knew. And what he said years ago, there is... Repeating once again, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. You can hear the conflict in there. Paul was going to areas where the forces of darkness, the kingdoms of the world, and Satan had raised this flag, planted this flag in those lands and those nations, among those people. 
determined, and Paul's going, determined to establish a beachhead for landing the kingdom of God and claiming there's lives for Jesus Christ. So everything in our story to start off as we get to Philippians, it's all about roads. Oh, I love the line from that famous movie with the Dr. Emmett Brown, where we are going, we don't need roads. But Paul needed roads. It's all about road traveling from city to city to share the gospel about Christ. And Paul's journey began when he was Saul. He traveled on the Damascus Road to arrest those who belonged to the way. That's what they called Christians at that time. They belonged to the way. He was on his way to arrest them. And on that road to Damascus, the spirit of Jesus blinded him with a bright light and asked why he was persecuting him. And then Jesus gave Saul his life mission and told him, you are my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to Gentiles and to the people of Israel. And so Saul became Paul, and he went on the road teaching Jesus is the Messiah, planting churches wherever he went throughout Israel and expanding into Turkey. And so when we pick up the story in Acts 16, he had come to the end of the road visiting all of those new churches, or revisiting all of those new churches that he had planted earlier. And so what was he to do, turn and go back? No, he didn't run out of road. You see, because there was over 50,000 miles of road in the Roman Empire at that time. And he continued on. He decided not to turn back, but to keep going, and he headed west toward the province of Asia, but the Holy Spirit said no. And so he turned north to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus said, no. Not one no, but two no's. A lot of people would give up. They'd become discouraged and quit. Have you ever had the door shut on you before? Have you ever had the door shut? And what you wanted to do. Ever get a no from the Spirit? Ever get not just one no, but two? Back years ago when the Lord called me to preach, uh, we moved from Colorado Spring, uh, from uh, Socaville, Ohio to, uh, boy, Socaville was on the news yesterday, wasn't it? But from Socaville, Ohio to, um, to Colorado Springs, Moved there to prepare for, prepare for ministry. And at that time, there was no online education. You, you got in your car and you went to a classroom. You went to a place to study, to learn. And when we got to Colorado Springs, it was, uh, it was Michelle, Josh, and Mary. And so they were three, two, and the newborn. Hmm. And we got there and we had no job. And so you can imagine our excitement when Bob Green, who was the director of Golden Bell Ranch, which was the Colorado District Church of the Nazarene Camp, we received a call from him, and he offered us the caretaker position up there at Golden Bell Ranch. And we thought, this is the answer to our prayers. We would have a house in the Rocky Mountains. <sighs> right above Divide, Colorado, working at a church retreat setting with a rustic lodge and a beautiful gymnasium and an indoor swimming pool. We had lunch with Bob and Joe, and after spending two or three hours with them touring the facility, going over job responsibilities, we said we would pray about this. We were excited. And as excited as we were, it was rather quiet in the car as we were heading down that rough dirt road down the mountain. The job was right up my alley. I mean, I'd been farming for years, and now outdoor person, right up my alley. We'd be provided with a house for a family and a beautiful setting in the woods with deer and bear and just every wildlife imaginable up there. It's a great opportunity, but we both had a 
a sunken feeling in our hearts. I'll never forget it. And we both sent the Lord saying, no. And we declined the position. Did I tell you we didn't have a job? We, we thought this was the answer to the prayers that we'd been praying. That God was opening a huge door for us at, at Golden Bell Ranch in the mountains. But the answer was no. In order for a better yes to happen. Here's the amazing thing. They gave me a job anyhow because I was without a job until I found one down in the springs. You see, it was only later that we saw the wisdom of the no. We had uprooted our family, moved miles to focus on the unglamorous work of study and ministry preparation. And the glamorous job of a retreat center with all the surrounding would have sidetracked you get it? Would have sidetracked and possibly even derailed what God had called us to do. So sometimes we, we never know the, the reason for the no. But God knows are just as pivotal as his yeses. Right. Right. Just as pivotal. You can trust them both. It was Alexander Graham Bell who said, when one door closes, another one opens, but we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one that has opened for us. Oh, it's easy to become frustrated and discouraged and confused when we hear a no. It becomes prime ground for second-guessing ourselves, thinking that we're doing something wrong. But for Paul and Silas and Timothy on this journey, they weren't doing anything wrong. Their motives were absolutely pure. Their, they were carrying out their mission mandate. They were on target. They were going to places to preach the word, to introduce light in dark places. But for some reason unknown to them and unknown to us, it's not, we're not told the spirit of Jesus kept them, prevented them, said no. I'm not sure how he said no. I know for us he said no. We, we knew together that it was, it wasn't, there was no conflict here. We were on the same, she had the same feeling I had. We had the same excitement together prior to. We don't, we don't know how the Spirit said no to Paul and Silas and Timothy. It might have been an inner gut feeling, kind of like what we had. Or maybe there were some external circumstances. Maybe there was an illness that shifted the direction. Maybe there was an opposition that was coming up that caused them to divert. Maybe they came to the border crossing and they couldn't get through. Right? We don't know how the Spirit said no in forming the roadblocks. We don't know the how. We don't know the whys of the no. But Paul didn't just sit there and wring his hands and rack his brain trying to figure out why he couldn't, why can't I go, or what God was, trying, was up to. His mission mandate didn't change, so he went on to Troas. When, when COVID-19 hit, when the pandemic, when all the shutter-in-place rulings went, came, came on us, affected all of us, clear back in March, the government says, no more large group gatherings. Folks, our mission mandate did not change.
Our goal was still to preach the word of God, and the Spirit said yes to expanding the broadband online. And our ministry reach, can you believe this, has more than doubled what we were reaching beforehand. He hadn't have said no to the large group gathering. We wouldn't have been able to say yes to reaching a bigger audience, a congregation, a world for Jesus Christ. You see, the spirit no doesn't mean stop preaching, stop carrying out the mission. It simply meant change directions. Change directions. And so Paul and his companions, they made their way to Troas on the coast of the Aegean Sea. And when they got to Troas, you know what they did? They went to sleep. During the night, Paul had a vision. He went to sleep. It was during the night. He had the vision of the man of Macedonia standing and begging, come over to Macedonia and help us. There was an urgency, and he was standing. He was begging. You can, Paul somehow could sense the urgency in this man of Macedonia. We don't know who he is, who he was. But there was an urgency, a desperation in his voice. There was a specific place, come to Macedonia, across the Aegean Sea. And there was a specific need, come and help us. And Paul must have shared this vision with them. Because in the next verse we're told, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach to them. Paul must have shared that vision with the other guys in the group. You see, discerning the will of God for all of us as, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, discerning the will of God, his yes, is of real interest to us. I'm sure many of you have wrestled over how God was leading. You, you've wrestled over that in your minds, in your hearts before. It's a real concern to spirit-led Christ followers who want to be obedient in all things. And it deals with the question of discerning the spirit's leadership because there doesn't appear to be an audible voice outside of the man in the vision saying, come help us. But here's the thing, only Paul saw the vision. <clears throat> only Paul saw the vision, but, but this wasn't a case of Paul saying, okay, boys, I've had a vision. You all follow me now. That's not what happened. So after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready to go, concluding that God had called us to go to Macedonia, to preach to them. You see, the vision didn't just affect Paul and just old Paul, nor was it his own private vision that Silas and Timothy were to take for granted, unquestioned, following blindly. No, he shared the vision with them for their consideration and for their confirmation, just to make sure that he wasn't crazy in this thing. He sought their counsel. And together they concluded that God had called them to preach the gospel in Macedonia. Form, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, in a, in a um, Saturday Evening Post article, she said, ideally, when Christians meet as Christians to take counsel together, their purpose is not, or should not be, to ascertain what is the mind of the majority, but what is the mind of the spirit, something which may be 
entirely quite different. They weren't aiming for a majority vote. They were tuning in to the mind of the Spirit. And they were knitted together in agreement. Kathy and I were knitted together in agreement for me. Who the Lord saying no. It wasn't one dominant, it wasn't trying, hey, I, I vote that. Mm -mm, no. We start the mind of the Spirit. And they were knitted together in agreement. And they boarded the ship and they made their way to Asia, to, from Asia, from the province of Asia, but which was also part of the continent of Asia, and across the Aegean Sea to Macedonia, modern day Greece. Europe. But we need to ask, was, was this vision, was this yes, only to the man of Macedonia vision? Or could there be, have been another player in the game? Could there be, have been another reason for the yes to the man of Macedonia? You see, the closed doors, the no and the no, led them to Troas, where they not only had the vision of the man of Macedonia, but I want you to notice the ship. Oh, page to page to take a careful look at the grammar. All up through the journey to this point, it had been they, third person plural pronoun. They, they, they did this, they, 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 they. they. And now we come to a we. It's almost as, as if I said, uh, I said uh, you know, Calvin and, uh, and Roger, okay, they, they, they were going to drive to the church and, and, and pull in the parking lot. They drove to the church and pulled in the parking lot. And then we, I'm talking, we went to the Ohio State game yesterday. Oh, how about that? <laughs> now, we didn't go. But oh, it was a great game. And they won. Big deal. <laughs> but that's what's happening here in the story. See, Luke is the writer of Acts. And he's talking about they who've been on this journey so far, and they came to Troas, and now we got ready. Luke joined in. Oh, it becomes first person. Pronoun. Pro, pro, pronoun. We got we and us involved here. Luke had joined them. The yes just, just wasn't for the man of Macedonia vision. It was also so that Luke could be on board on the ministry team. That they could go to, they needed Luke's leadership. They needed Luke's giftings. They met the writer of Luke here in Troas. You see, Luke was a writer. He was a historian, but he was a doctor. He knew Greek. He was Greek, and he knew Greek, and he spoke Greek and Latin. And he may have attended one of the best medical schools in the whole European area that was in Philippi. And he happened to be in Troas. Happened to be. When Paul and Silas and Timothy met there. He completed the ministry team that was to cross over to that new continent, to a diverse culture. They needed someone who understood the culture. They had Timothy, who was young. He, was, he had mixed parents. His father was Greek. His mother was Jewish. There was Silas. He was in the mix. He was a Hellenistic Jew. He was a leader at the church in Jerusalem. So he had leadership and authority, authoritative powers there. He was also a Roman citizen. And then we have the Apostle Paul, who was very Jewish, but he was a natural-born Roman citizen, which will play, be a big deal in the later part of this story. He was seminary trained. He knew he was a man of the book. He knew Aramaic. He knew Greek. He was a tent maker. The ministry team had come together. And they set sail from Troas, and they landed in Neapolis, new city, that means, and they jumped on the yellow brick road. 
to give the Greco-Roman world the gospel of a new king, Jesus Christ. That yellow brick road was called Via Ignatia. 20 feet wide, paved with stone. Only one, less than 1% 1 is visible today. Most of it runs underneath modern highways. 700 miles long, stretching from Byzantium, from modern-day Istanbul, Turkey, all the way to Dyrrhachium, or Durs, modern-day Albania. I think we have a map of that. You could see it. And right in here, they landed in Kavala, which is Neapolis. And the road goes right up through Philippi. So Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke left Neapolis, marched nine miles northwest to Philippi. But just because they were armed with a vision and a divine yes doesn't mean it's going to be smooth sailing. Remember what C.S. Lewis says, there's no neutral ground in the universe. And they reached Philippi. Philippi was originally, it was a, it was a, it was a small Greek gold mining town that was named after Philip II, king of Macedonia, Alexander the Great's father. But it was later conquered by the Romans, and just outside the walls of Philippi was the site of one of the most world-changing battles in all of history. And that took place on the plains of Drama, the plains of Philippi. It was right on the Via Ignatia, right on the road that Paul and his companions were on. And that battle was an all-Roman affair. And famous names that you've heard of, they met there on those plains. In 42 BC, there was Brutus and Cassius and their legions of 103,000 on one side of the road and Octavian and Mark Antony with 123,000 legions, troops, on the other side. And the reason for that battle all had to do with avenging the assassination of Julius Caesar two years earlier on the Ides of March. You've heard these words, haven't you? It was on the Ides of March when about 40 Roman senators, including Brutus and Cassius, they stabbed Caesar how many times? Did they say? 23. Time. Shakespeare, I think, would tell us. 23 times, they, they wanted, the Roman senators wanted to rule Rome as a senatorial republic. But Caesar, on the other hand, who had conquered Gaul, the region of France and all around there, he was popular with the people and he wanted to rule Rome as dictator or as emperor. And as one writer in those ancient days said, you can have a republic, you can have an empire, but you can't have both. Can't have both. So after Caesar's assassination, Brutus and Cassius, they fled Rome, took the Via Ignatia to Philippi, and just beyond there, where they raised an army. Octavian and Mark Antony. Octavian, who was Julius Caesar's Grand, great nephew, he was his adopted son. They took their troops, got on the Via Ignatia, and these collective armies met together in Philippi. And Octavian, Mark Antony, won, which meant Rome was to be an empire. But who was to be the emperor? Two big egos, two big egos. And they battled it out about 10 years later at Actium. And Octavian won, Mark Antony took tail and went to Egypt to be with Cleopatra where they committed suicide. And Octavian became emperor, 
became Caesar Augustus, who was emperor when Jesus Christ was born. Talk about history changing. And after that battle, Caesar Augustus rewarded his retiring soldiers with land all around Philippi and in the city. And he declared it, as Luke says, a Roman colony. It's a term. It means it is a little Rome. That whatever happens in Rome and however you deal with things in Rome, it's how it's going to happen in Philippi. A little Rome with all of the laws and the customs and the privileges and the, the tax exemptions. It was as if Philippi in Macedonia was actually on Italian soil, a suburb of Rome. That's how the city was to be treated. It was a proud city. It was Caesar's city. And there were coins minted with Caesar Augustus and the words Savior of the world stamped on them. Statues were erected in his honor that called him the deified one. Altars announced the gospel, and that's what they called it. They called it the gospel of Caesar, the gospel of Pax Romana, the gospel of Roman peace that has come. It was the golden age of Rome, Roman peace and prosperity and pleasure. And it had all come through the dominate, by the dominating power of the imperator, where the conquering Caesar Augustus was crowned Lord and God. And so when the Apostle Paul and his companion walked to Via Ignatia to Philippi, Little did they know that the road of two no's, two no detours, and a straight on yes, was taking them to a battleground of conflicting kingdoms. And it's no different in our world. Because you see, the way Jesus became Lord and God and brought peace to our lives was very from the way Caesar Augustus bring peace. Jesus brought peace by his sacrificial death on a Roman cross. Caesar bring peace by killing your enemies. Very different kingdoms. And these kingdoms clash. And our disciples, our apostles, our ministry team was marching in the little room where Caesar Augustus was Lord and God. And they were marching there to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, that he is Savior of the world. So Lewis is right. There's no neutral ground in the universe. It's either claimed for the kingdom of Christ or it is counterclaimed for the kingdom of Satan, of Caesar, of the powers of this world. So where is your via Ignatia? Where is your Ignatian way, the road? It'll lead to conflict. The no's and yeses sometimes takes you to your little room. Sometimes it brings people to you on that road. The guy's name was Peter. He lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Peter worked at a fast food joint in that city, and he couldn't find a job after graduating from Harvard. <laughs> but he needed to pay bills. So he had a job there at the joint. And a friend of his from church had stopped by for a sandwich, and he expressed, first of all, surprise, and then sorrow that his friend was just simply 
flipping burgers. I mean, it has a degree from Harvard. But this is his job. But you know what Peter said? Peter said, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. God has me here. God has me here. He's had some no's for the degree. And he has a yes to the fast food joint for a reason. He said, God has me here. This place has given me awesome opportunities to share Christ. He said, I'm on the same shift as a fella from a Muslim fella from Lebanon, a Buddhist guy from Sri Lanka, a, a Hindu lady from India, and a fellow Christian from El Salvador. It's awesome. I get to be a global missionary to my co-workers all while asking, would you like fries with that? <laughs> he was on the road. He found us via Ignatia, or perhaps it found him. And that road was bringing people to him to claim ground for the kingdom of God and for Jesus Christ. So where's your via Ignatia? Where is it leading you? Because you see, if we are Christian, we all have the mandate to go make disciples, every one of us. We don't want to be disobedient to the vision. And it was Joanne Wagner's desire that we should continue to go. It was her desire. She loved the church, and she made arrangements to see the church continue with its mission to carry out God's mandate, even after her death. And so I'm going to pronounce a blessing. But you're invited to follow me out the doors or out, out wherever the doors, head down the sidewalk towards the shelter house to remember her as she has remembered her church. Remember, there's no neutral ground in the universe. So as you go, make sure we're claiming lives for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Shall we? We're going to try that one again. Remember, there is no neutral ground in the universe. As you go, go to claim ground, lives for the kingdom of Christ. Shall we? Yes. Amen. Let's stand together. Oh. You can hear the power in this blessing, not because it's coming from me, because of what the word says. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.